Look up the word crazy in the dictionary and you might just find an asterisk beside the definition that says, listen to the Subiquitous podcast featuring Sue Duffield and you'll find out what crazy means. Sue's travelogue journey of unfiltered stories, impossible miracles, and faith-filled fun will be revisited right here. So buckle up and let's get going with this humorous travelogue of an unfiltered saint, Subiquitous. You know, there's a blessing and a curse of putting yourself out there in the podcast realm. And that there's always going to be the analytics and the trends and statistics that can either haunt you or help you. And Sue Duffield has discovered that there has to be a balance when it comes to evaluating your own broadcast and podcast material. Yes, it's important to seek help and guidance from podcasters who are well advanced in their reach, but it can also be a detriment to your own performance if and when there's not the exact comparison. Here's an example. No one has ever compared me to an opera singer. (laughs) It's just not my genre. And to be put into a category of clean comedy when sometimes the stream of this particular episodic podcast can switch quickly into a different feel or theme or even an anointed spontaneous direction. You've been with me on those. And depending on the subject or the guests, things can change. So since I have no guests today, I want to talk to you personally about the subject of what I think is called thinking the worst or the title, what if. Just this week, I immediately fell prey to feeling defeated just a little bit when seeing that the last two weeks has been less than stellar in the amount of listeners and downloads on this ubiquitous podcast. I got to tell you, this was a first. Every month since March of 2020, since its very inception and beginning, we have grown. But the last two weeks took a little bit of a dive and Instead of investigating why, I quickly thought, well, maybe I've flatlined, or maybe I've hit a wall, or maybe I said something to offend my audience, or or maybe one of my guests offended them. I don't know. So while I was disillusioned for about a day or so, and not really near any Wi-Fi of any significance, I took it on the chin and thought, Sue Duffield, you're not all that anyway. Be happy with what you've accomplished in this virtual world and just be done with it. Put your phone away. And then the email came, and I'll quote, Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N, Libsyn, the podcast scheduling platform has been having serious update problems. Please know that we are doing all we can to fix the problem. You may see incorrect analytics and numbers and downloads at this time. Please know that we are doing all we can here at Libsyn to solve the problem. (laughs) Smackaroo in the head. There you have it. The fact, though, that I was discouraged by the numbers was in fact a jump-to-the-gun approach and when indeed the real reason was a technological problem. You know, I used to feel the same surge of increased heartbeat whenever a high school teacher or counselor would call concerning our son in those days. (laughs) Oh man, he had a proven record actually of his parents assuming that something could be wrong. And if indeed the school was calling, of course. But the one time I was called into the office over David's activity... I was already rehearsing how the penalty and the punishment would go down. Yep, we're going to take away his car keys. We're going to make him walk to school. You know, the whole gamut. So I was prepared, I thought, until the teacher in the office informed me that David was late to most of his classes. Usually at least three to five minutes late. And I'm already feeling it just swell up inside of me. I knew how big the school was, but I didn't, you know, it just, I just didn't want to waste my time trying to defend him. I was always in the teacher's court anyway. I was old school. 
"'You have a bright boy, Mrs. Duffield, and I'm sure you've heard that before. "'You know he wants to quit school, right?' "'Yeah, I did know that. "'But do you know the reason why he's late to most of his classes?' "'Well, I took a deep breath, thinking, "'What else don't I know? You've been there before.' Well, you see, Mrs. Duffield, there's a handicapped boy in several of his classes, and since he has a tough time carrying his own books, your son carries them for him, making sure he gets to his class. And we here at the school wanted to be sure you knew why his tardiness to class was really because of a bigger reason. Well, the worst didn't happen. But as a mom, I automatically thought the worst. It was the biggest turnaround of emotion in one single second. One moment, I'm going to kill him. And the next moment, <laughs> I'm very proud of this kind young man that Jeff and I have raised. And to this very day, unless he listens to this podcast, which I highly doubt, he doesn't even know that his parents know how he helped that disabled young man every single day. He never told us, and we never told him that we knew. What if, what if, I've spent literally a lifetime considering the what ifs in my life. Those questions have a way of unsettling me, destroying my peace, and sometimes leaving me insecure. You know, people in the Bible were uneasy about what-if questions, too. And when told to lead the Israelites, Moses asked God, What if they don't believe me? Abraham's servant asked about Isaac's future wife. What if the young woman refused to come with me? And even Joseph's brothers asked, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us? All of them wondered what would happen if circumstances went crazy just like we do. We all face a staggering array of what-ifs. Some are minor issues while others have life-altering repercussions. What if my child dies? What if I get cancer? What if my spouse leaves me? Well, these are things I've been thinking about this week. The uncomfortable truth is any of those things could happen. No one is free from extreme tragedy or pain. There are no guarantees of an easy life for any of us, ever. And I was considering this sobering reality a few months ago, and over the course of several days, I brought numerous longings and requests before the Lord, and I wanted them fulfilled. But the unthinkable question sometimes still comes back. What if my inmost longings are never met and my nightmares come true? Have you ever said that to God? Is God enough? Hmm. As I sat looking over my Bible, I was reminded of the question I had wrestled with for decades. Is God enough? If my deepest fears are realized, will he still be sufficient? Each time those questions had come up in the past, I'd push them out of my mind because that's how you're raised, right? But this time I knew I needed to face them. You know, I wondered if, if my health spirals downward and I end up in an institution, will God be enough? These are the things people think about. If my child rebel and, and never you know, come back to the Lord, will that be enough? Will God be enough? If I never you know, feel loved, if, if my ministry doesn't flourish, if I never see fruit, if my suffering continues, if I never see the purpose in it, uh, I wish I could have automatically said, yes, of course, God will be sufficient. But in reality, most of us would say, I didn't want to give up my dreams, surrender those things that were dear to me, relinquish what I felt entitled to, and I struggle sometimes. <sighs> Is God enough? I reflected on my, <laughs> what I would call, a unilateral, unwritten contract with God where I promise to do my part if He fulfills my longings. And I reluctantly admitted that part of my desire to be faithful was rooted in my expectation of a payback. Doesn't God owe me something? I opened my hands filled with my dreams and surrendered them to God, and I say, 
with that Jersey accent right now. I didn't want to love God for what he could do for me. I wanted to love God for who he is, to worship him because he is worthy. God's presence overwhelmed me as I literally relinquished my expectations. That doesn't mean I settled for less. If anything, bigger things started to jump into my lap. He reminds me that I have something far better than a reassurance that my dreaded what ifs won't happen. I have the assurance that even if they do happen, he will be there in the midst of them and he will carry me. He will comfort me. He will tenderly care for me. God doesn't promise us a trouble-free life, but he does promise that he will be there in the midst of all of our sorrow. Even if, even if in the Bible, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego were not guaranteed deliverance. Just before Nebuchadnezzar delivered them into the fire, they offered some of the most courageous words ever spoken. Are you ready for this? If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. Oh boy, put that on a post-it note. But even if he does not, we want you to know that we will not serve your gods. What if even if, Daniel chapter 3, 17 and 18, even if the worst happens, God's grace is sufficient. Those three young men faced the fire without fear because they knew that whatever the outcome, it would ultimately be for their good and for God's glory. They didn't ask, what if the worst happened? They were satisfied knowing that even if the worst happened, God would take care of them. Those two simple words have taken the fear out of life. Replacing what if with even if is one of the most liberating exchanges we can ever make. We trade our irrational fears of an uncertain future for the loving assurance of an unchanging God. We see that even if the worst happens, God will carry us. He will still be good and he will never leave us. Habakkuk models this exchange too. He, though he had pleaded with God to save his people, he closes his book with an exquisite even if. <laughs> I love this. Even if the fig tree doesn't bloom and the vines have no grapes, even if the olive tree fails to produce and the fields yield no food, even if the sheep pen is empty and the stalls have no cattle, even then I will be happy with the Lord and I will truly find joy in God who saves me. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18. Man, even if the analytics are stellar, <laughs> even if the download numbers are wrong, I choose to believe that I am saying with all of my heart, I desire the presence of God, even if everything around me looks dismal, even if it makes no sense, even if God should call you right this minute when you're getting some words by a phone call or by an email that has you shaking in your boots and suddenly you say, even if God, whose report will I believe? I shall believe the word of the Lord. And by far, hmm. <laughs> He will comfort you. He will tenderly care for you. And God surely does not promise us a trouble-free life, but he does promise us that he will be there in the midst of our sorrows. So I got rid of the analytics. The problem is, as a podcaster, you're constantly reading all of the technologies, all of the books, trying to stay up to date with everything. And it can get really, really weird. <laughs> and I automatically thought that no one was listening. And then I come to find out that the whole Libsyn site was down. What did I learn? What did Sue Duffield learn? 
Don't jump to conclusions, for one thing. (laughs) And don't pretend for one minute. Don't pretend. But bring God into every decision that's in your life and bring God into every single heartbeat of your life. And even if you walk into an office at a high school and you sit down and you know for sure you're going to get bad news, Praise God, you walk out of that office and you say to yourself, Forgive me, Jesus, for thinking the worst, because the best just happened. This ubiquitous podcast, often imitated, never equaled, and of course, the humorous travelogue of an unfiltered saint, you can get on sueduffield.com. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for allowing us the privilege one more time of being in your ear today. We'll see you next week.